In this video, we will review the different types of screen resources that are available in our CombiVis Studio HMI software, as well as how to set up basic screen navigation between them. So let's get started. Here I have an empty project that I've created with a new project wizard. My default screen size is 800 pixels wide by 600 pixels tall, and I have a default screen color of gray. This was set up using the new project wizard, but it can be changed at any time in these general project uh, settings. To add my first screen, I will right click on the screens resource and click add a new screen. I will call mine main. And we can see that we have inserted a blank screen that is the defined default size as well as color. Our first task is to simply switch screens between this and another. So I will create a second screen, call this other screen. I will add a label to each so we can identify which screen we are on. Save time, I'm going to copy and paste and just alter my text. So now we have our first two screens. I'm also going to disable the fit in window property on each of my created screens. And this will keep the aspect ratio locked when we go to simulation mode here. So to navigate between the two screens, I'm going to use a push button. I will go to my toolbox, push buttons, and I will use an XAML modern button. To make it stand out, I'm gonna make the background color white, a little bit easier to see. And I'm going to label it other screen. And I was able to enter the text just by double clicking on the button element. So the most common way to change screens is by pressing one of these push button elements and executing a command. So the commands executed by the button are available here in the execution properties. And when I release the button, I want to change screens. So I'm going to add a new command, select the screen command type, open normal screen change, and I will select my other screen. Click OK. I'm going to make this font a little bigger to see. So now our HMI operator should have a way to change to the other screen. However, we don't want them to get stranded on that screen, so we will create a return button. To save time, I'm going to copy and paste the previously created button. I'm going to place it in the lower left corner. I'm going to change the text to return. Then I'm going to edit my previously created screen command. I will click edit. And rather than opening the other screen, we will open the main screen. Now that I have my two screens created with our navigation buttons, I'm going to run this HMI project in simulation mode. Okay. Here I am on my main screen, and if I click on the other screen button, I've navigated to the other screen. And if I click return, I'm back to my main screen. Now I will demonstrate how to create a pop-up screen. Pop-up screens are very useful for cases where you want to display very important information to the operator or to offload a user input or information to a second screen. I will add a new screen resource to my project by right-clicking, selecting add a new screen. I will call this pop-up screen. And this pop-up screen will be displayed in front of the calling screen. So I will make this screen smaller so it doesn't take up the whole window. I will make it half as wide and half as tall, 400 by 300 pixels. And if I click the check mark, we can see that it is resized. I will open this pop-up screen with another push button. So once again, I will copy and paste this one that I've previously created. 
will rename this pop-up screen and I will edit the screen command associated to this new button. This time, instead of open normal, we will select open modal for pop-up screens. I will browse for my pop-up screen, select it, and select OK. I want to disable the caption and border for the pop-up screen. We can also define the position at which the pop-up screen is opened on the screen, both its X and Y position, and this is measured the top left corner of the overall screen is 0, 0, and the top left corner of your pop-up screen is defined by these coordinates. So to open this in the center of the screen, I will want a X position of 200 pixels and a Y position of 150 pixels. Select OK. Now just as before, I want a way to close my pop-up screen. So I will go to the pop-up screen. I will once again add a label for reference. And I will resize this to the width of my pop-up. Name this pop-up screen. And I will add another push button to this pop-up screen. I'm going to center it. I will call this exit. Now I'll once again edit the screen command. This screen field can be left blank and our action will be close and return back. I'm going to save my project. Since I disabled the border on my pop-up screen call, I'm going to insert my own border with a rectangle element. I'm going to make it the size of our pop-up screen. And instead of a white fill, I'm going to, instead of a solid fill for my rectangle element, I will choose null. And we can see that it is now clear. I will run the simulation once again from our main screen. From our main screen now, if I select pop-up screen, the pop-up will display in the center as I have instructed it to. And if I click exit, the screen will close. Screen navigation is most commonly performed by clicking on elements such as these push buttons. However, it can also be very useful to trigger a screen change off of something like an event or an alarm being met. I will demonstrate changing a screen based on an event. To do so, I will add an event variable to our real-time database. I will call it event bar. And it will be a Boolean. Now, I will create an event. I will leave it as its default name. Now, select my event variable that I just created. I want my event to trigger and the screen to change when the value is equal to 1. So when the boolean is true. Finally, I will control my event variable with another push button. I'll choose a round button this time. And I can simply link my variable to the button by clicking and dragging to it. In my event, I will set up a command. This will be another screen command. And I will select my pop-up screen once again. So now, when we run in simulation mode, we should be controlling our event variable with this push button. And when it is true, when the button is pushed, we should trigger a screen open command, which will open our pop-up screen. This should be open modal. We'll save once again and run. Now if I press the button, our variable will go true. 
and we can see that our screen has been opened. Now I have the extra border and caption displayed because I did not change those in the screen command. I also did not change the default position to open the screen in, which is why it is shifted now. And this point would correspond to 100, 100, which was the default value. So I will click exit. Next, I will demonstrate how to select a startup screen. Without defining a startup screen, when the HMI project is deployed to a HMI device, the project will not know where to start. In our simulation mode, up until this point, the simulation simply starts with the screen that is displayed. However, if this was deployed to a device, the project would not start. I'm going to create a special startup screen. I could just simply use my main screen, but I will call this startup screen. Oftentimes, startup screens are used to display a company logo and contact information for the OEM of a machine. To save a little bit of time, I'm going to go to this other project that I've created before, and I am going to copy and paste this KEB information into my new project. Next, I want the operator to be able to navigate to the main screen from the startup screen by pressing anywhere on the screen. So, to do this, I will go to my toolbox and I will insert a rectangle element. I will make this the height and width of the whole screen. Once again, I will select the color to be null. And I will make sure that this element is in the very front of the screen using this icon here, bring to front. I also want to add text to this rectangle element, and it will say click to continue. By default, it is in the middle of the element. To change this, I'm going to go to the font properties, text align bottom, but I want to offset it from the very bottom by 30 pixels. We can see that it is now visible at the bottom, I'm going to make the text bigger. Next, I will set up a normal screen change command as we have done before. This rectangle element can also have click commands assigned to it, just like the push buttons. I will go to new command, screen, open normal, I will leave, and I will select the main screen. I will save this. Now I will close all documents that I have open. Now with all of my screens closed in CombiVis Studio HMI, when I start the project, it will launch with our startup screen. And if I click anywhere on the screen, we will continue to the main screen. So we have successfully defined a startup screen that displays company information, and on click, we'll navigate to the main screen. Next, I will demonstrate how to use embedded screens in CombiVis Studio HMI. Embedded screens are very useful for displaying multiple screens worth of information within one screen, as well as acting as navigation bars or headers. First, I will create another screen. I will call this Embedded 1, because I will create a second one later. And just like our pop-up screen, I am going to make this one smaller. We'll make it 300 pixels wide and 400 pixels tall. I will once again add my own border to this with a simple rectangle. This time I will leave the white background to make it stand out on the gray background of our main screen. I will also copy and paste my label from my main screen, place it here, fit it to my new window, name this embedded one. Now with my embedded screen created, next I want to view my embedded screen on the main screen. 
To do this, I will go to my toolbox, advanced objects, and then I will select embedded view. I'm automatically prompted to select the screen that I would like to view. I don't see embedded one listed in the resource browser, so I will click refresh, and it is displayed there. Select it and select OK. We can see that the embedded view is much smaller than our embedded screen. To avoid any distortion, it is recommended to always make the embedded view the same size as your embedded screen. This should be 300 by 400. We can see that it is not distorted anymore. Now, if I run this in simulation mode from the main screen, we can see that my embedded screen is now viewable within the main screen, as we will show next. Embedded screens may also be made dynamic so they can show multiple embedded screens within one embedded view. I will create a second embedded screen. I will name this one Embedded 2. When an embedded screen is dynamic, it is controlled by an embedded screen variable. I will add a new variable. I'll call this embedded screen var. And the value of this variable is set to the screen name. So it'll be a string. I'll click OK and save. And in the properties of our embedded view, I will select the embedded screen variable in the style properties. I will select the newly created string. Now I need a method to change the value of the embedded screen variable during runtime. I will go to my first embedded screen, and I would like to use an arrow from our symbol library so that when the operator clicks on the arrow, the embedded screen changes within the embedded view. Center this. Now with my arrow from the symbol library, I will define a click command as we have done before. This time instead of a screen command, I will have a variable command. I will browse from my variable and this will be our embedded screen variable. And I will set it to a value of embedded2. I'm going to copy and paste this to Embedded 2. I will flip this so it changes directions when the embedded view is changed. And I will alter my variable command so that clicking on the arrow on Embedded 2 sets the embedded screen variable to Embedded 1 and changes which screen is visible in the embedded view. I will save and close these. Now I will run in simulation mode from our main screen. We can see that embedded one has been updated with the new arrow element. And if I click on it, the screen that is visible within the embedded view has changed to embedded two. I will click on it again, and we are back to embedded one. Finally, I'm going to demonstrate how to create parameterized screens. Parameterized screens allow you to create one screen resource to display multiple screens worth of data. For my example, I want to create two different parameterized screens to edit two different sets of variables. I'm first going to create a structure prototype in our real-time database. I'll call this struct. And I will add three different variables to it. Var1, var2, and var3. Next, I will add two instances of this structure to be edited by our two different parameterized screens. I will add a new variable. I will call it struct1. And the type will be structure.
For reference, on our main screen, I will display all six variables from our two structures that I've just created. Parameterized screens use what are called alias variables to link to their elements rather than our real-time DB variables. The alias variables are defined with parameter files. I will add a new parameter file named param1. You can see that we have an alias column and a variable column. I'm going to right click and select new alias. For simplicity, I will call this alias1. And our variable is the associated real-time DB variable that corresponds to this alias name. For this, I will select struct1 var1. I will also make an alias for my other two variables within struct1. This time I will browse for the variable rather than typing it as I did before. Bar2, OK. Alias3. Bar3. This colon notation denotes that this var1 is a member of struct1. With my parameter file created for struct1, I will copy it, leave it as param2, and now param2 will link our same alias variables now to struct2. So I will change this to struct2 var1, I will change this to struct2 var2. Finally, I will change this to struct2 var3. I will save. Next, I will create the screen element that will serve as my parameterized screen. I'll call it param screen. Once again, I will make this smaller because I will open it as a pop-up. 400 by 300. The goal of my parameterized screen is to allow the operator to edit the members of struct1 and struct2. To edit the values of the variables, I will use an edit box element. Resize this. Change the font size. Center it on our screen. Instead of directly linking a real-time DB variable as we normally would for the variable that will be edited, I will type alias1. I will copy this for our other two variables. change their variable to alias2 and alias3. As this is a pop-up screen, I also want to include a method to return to the main screen. So I will go to my previously created pop-up screen, and I will copy and paste my exit button. I will move these up. I will also add some text labels to the edit boxes so that we know which variables we are changing. So I will call this var1. I will recenter this on our screen and save. Our parameterized screen is now complete. We now need to set up the screen commands that will open it. On our main screen, I will include some elements to display the values of var1, var2, and var3 within struct1 and struct2 for reference. I'll use a rectangle to do this. I will label these var1, var2, and var3. Then I will label my columns struct1, and finally 
a stroke two. Next, I will link the members of each structure to their appropriate display. I will select text display value and do that for each. Finally, I will add our push buttons that will trigger the open modal command to open our parameterized screen. I will call these edit since we are editing the values of the displayed variables. Next, I will change the associated screen command. I will refresh and select my parameterized screen. Unlike before, we will not leave the parameter file field blank. We will instead select param1, as this is the push button for struct1. Next, I will copy this and edit the command for param2. One very important parameter to set for our parameter screen is to disable the keep always in memory command, which we can see is already disabled. And we will also change the close screen delay to zero. Finally, I will save and run again in simulation mode. Now I will edit the contents of struct1 by clicking on our button. We'll change these to 1, 2, 3 and click exit. We can see that the value of our real-time DB variables have changed even though the edit boxes in the pop-up screen were linked to our alias variable names. Now for struct2 I will select edit and I will change these to values of 3, 2, 1. And these have also changed. As you can see, parameterized screens are very useful for displaying or editing multiple screens worth of similar information.